Well, all right. Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, villagers, and maybe soon to be villagers. I'm Paul Herring, and you're watching Meet the Candidates. This year, we've uh, rounded up some great folks for you to see, um, and uh, we're not done. Uh, this evening, I have someone that we'd like to introduce to you on Meet the Candidates, and um, I think you'll be impressed with her credentials. But before we do that, I want to encourage you guys to get involved with public access television by calling 810-239-2901. If not public access television, we've got the radio station, WFOV 92.1 LPFM Flint, Our Voices Radio, and they could use you as well, 810-259-9789. With that said, I'm gonna introduce you to my guest this evening, and it is, ta-da, Mary Hood. Hi, Mary, how are you? Wonderful. How are you, Paul? I am always wonderful. Always. Listen, I, I don't want to start out with the question, tell me about yourself. I don't want to start out with that one. I want you to, let's get it out of the way. Why are you running for this seat? Paul, that's not, that question um, requires quite a lengthy answer. Uh, because there are a number of reasons why I decided to run for a seat on the circuit court bench. I've been licensed to practice law in Michigan for 31 years. For six of those years, I practiced law. You know, I represented low-income families uh, for legal services of Eastern Michigan. I had my own law practice and I practiced family law. I did some personal injury um, law. I was a, an assistant city attorney for Highland Park. And after six years, a position be, became available in the referee's office for the 68th district court in the magistrate's office. I applied for that and I got that position. So I served as a quasi judicial officer for the first time 26 years ago. Quasi judicial officers are sort of like judges, but we're appointed. Um, and after six years, um, I was asked to apply for a, a position, an, another appointed position as circuit court as an attorney referee. I've been there for 20 years. Judge Ransom appointed me to that position. Judge Perry had appointed me. He was then the chief judge of, of district court. He had appointed me as a magistrate and Judge um, Ransom appointed me. I've been there for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and. I preside over family court matters. So custody and parenting time, divorces, child support, child abuse and neglect hearings, juvenile delinquency matters. Um, I have an opportunity to make decisions um, that impact the lives of children and families and to have an influence in their, their futures. But as a referee, uh, my decisions um, our recommendations. They're not orders that are um, have immediate effect. But a position became available. Judge Beagle, I serve at the pleasure of the, the chief judge. Judge Beagle is the chief judge of our circuit court. We'll have a new chief judge um, after he retires. He's aged out and he can no longer run. So here I am sitting in the referee's office coming in, getting up every day, Monday through Friday, day after day, week after week, year after year. And, um, and I've been doing the job and I have the experience to make a good circuit judge in the family division. Our new judge will be assigned to the family division. We'll have three new circuit court seats open up and all three of those seats, um, the judge, new judge will be assigned to the family division of the court. And I really think it's important that the community has an experienced jurist on the bench. Um, I have some ideas in terms of how to um, make the lives of our children. I believe that the family is the most important institution that, that we have. And it's essential that we repair our families. And I believe the family is in crisis. And I believe that I will be in a good position to use the knowledge that I've gained over the years to produce better outcomes for our young people and as a result for our community. 
Now here's here here's my question for you. This this court is it is it a local court or a regional court or a state court? It's a state court. All of our courts are state courts, um, but circuit court is a countywide court. So, okay. and it's jurisdiction. The difference between the district court and the circuit court um, would be jurisdiction. You know, what do they have jurisdiction over? Okay. Um, so circuit court, you won't find family court matters in district court. Circuit court has exclusive jurisdiction over family family law matters. Okay. Um, all right. Over, all right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So listen, I want I want to get to meet Mary Hood a little bit. Tell me, Mary, what was your elementary school? What elementary school did you go to? I I attended Cook Elementary School, except for a about a year and a half, my mother took me out of the school. She pulled me out and put me in Daniel O'Sullivan. So I did attend right down town on Fifth Avenue. She pulled me out of Cook and put me in uh, Catholic school for a year and a half. And then I returned to the public school. Nice, nice. Do, do you remember anything about the St. John neighborhoods? No, I don't. I grew up on Stockdale Street, so I grew up in the Welch Boulevard area. I remember the stories that, you know, because my entire family, my dad was born here in 1930. So my entire family, paternal family, have been here for almost a century, for a long time. And we heard about it. I heard about it, but I um, don't know a whole whole lot about it. But St. Now, John, yeah, I know it was an important uh, community. And before the, I believe the, the expressway came along. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now you said Stockdale. It was an important Stockdale and DuPont? Stockdale and DuPont? Stockdale, Stockdale between uh, Mason and Detroit Street. It used to be Detroit Street. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Because my wife actually. So the St. John neighborhood was east. Right. You right. said what now? My mm -hmm. wife actually lived on Stockdale there by DuPont Street. So she was just a couple of blocks away from you. Okay. We... <laughs> yeah. All right. So yes. now you went to, you went to Cook Elementary. Yeah, did she school. attend did she attend Cook? I think I you know, I, uh -huh. I you're gonna get me in trouble. I don't know if she attended Cook Elementary School. I think she did. I'm pretty sure she did. But I could be lying because I don't think they lived over there when she was in elementary school. They she lived over there when she was in high school, so I'm I'm not sure. Oh, I'm Cook sure. Longfellow and Flint Northern. Wow, maybe Longfellow. Cook Longfellow so, and and Flint Northern. Mm -hmm. So that's you. You went to Longfellow as well. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So now, were you a product of busing at all, or, or you were just walking to school, no. or? Yeah, we had to walk. You know who um, the children from when I started at Longfellow, um, seventh grade, busing started when I was in the eighth grade. So okay. you remember Emerson ju Middle School or Junior High School, what have you, they closed it and those children were bused. Some of them were bused over to Longfellow. Okay. So I wasn't a product of um, busing. Okay. So now but that it what what mm -hmm. was your first paid job and it can't be babysitting my first paid job i worked for anna's kitchen it was in the windmill place if i'm not mistaken anna's if kitchen. it wasn't there they had another location yeah it was anna's kitchen so Anna's was in mm -hmm. Windmill Place. That was my and, first job. And over there where the uh, rallies is. What was that called? Oh, my goodness. That was Windmill Place. They were in Water Street Pavilion and Windmill that Place. That was Windmill Place. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that was Windmill Place. Now, how long, um, how, how long did you it, work for Agonopolis? Not very long. I, I don't know if it was a summer job, but I just know I worked there for a couple of months, long enough to know that I didn't like serving. <laughs> so it wasn't long at all. Okay, good for you. So now what was your second job? My second job was with 
Michigan Bell. I worked for Michigan Bell in between um, graduating from University of Michigan Flint and law school, Thomas M. Cooley Law School. So I worked there for about a year and a half. And in fact, I had to make a critical decision because I was making pretty good money and um, I was what, about 24 years, 23 or 24 years old. I had a child when I was 18, a mouth to feed. So I had to make a decision. Um, do you go to law school or you keep this job where you know you can get overtime? You know, I loved working overtime. So it was a critical decision that I had to make. <clears throat> Um, but I did decide to go to law school, so I left Michigan Bell and went to law school. All right. Yeah. So do you feel that that was a, a good decision for you? Absolutely. It was tough. It, it, it didn't come without struggles. I mean, I had friends who graduated college or who went right in, you know, started at General Motors at age 18, and they had money, they had cars, they had homes. Um, and I had nothing. I had nothing. I mean, when I was 18 years old, I was on welfare. And, you know, I remember standing in welfare up there, standing in line with my young child, you know, to get food stamps. Uh -huh. I remember those days. So, I mean, it was tough, but I, I always knew I was going to be a lawyer. And that's what um, I was determined to do. And I don't think at the time I realized how hard it was, but I remember when I graduated law school, I didn't, I didn't have a suit to take the, our picture, you know, our class picture in. And someone loaned me a suit. So I spent many years, you know, really struggling um, financially as a single mother um, t raising my daughter. So it was a tough decision to decide you know, it wasn't a tough to say. I knew I had to do it, but it had to be considered, you know, losing that money was a consideration for sure. I All don't right, regret sir. it. I don't regret it because in the long run, um, I think I did okay for us, for my family. So so you, you had a daughter when you were 18. What was that like? That... I took it in stride. Um, I think having her helped motivate me. I mean, I was determined that we were going to have a good life. Uh, and I think that having her, uh, I had a lot of help. So I don't want to pretend that I did it all by myself because her father was a part of her life and his family were, she was very close to them and has always been to um, her paternal family, and she's close to my family too, but her paternal grandparents helped raise her and she spent a lot of time with them. Um, so um, I, I had some help so I could focus on my education if I was studying. And when I was at the University of Michigan, um, her dad would make sure that he took good care of her while I had, if I had to, an exam coming up or had a paper to write or, mm -hmm. you know, I remember those days I would be up in the attic writing papers when he, you know, would be downstairs with her taking care of her and making sure her needs were met. Um, so um, it was a difficult situation um, being poor and trying to, you know, make it through college um, at the same time, but I did have some help. Um, but it, it was tough. It was tough. I would not at all glorify teenage parentage, you know, being a teenage mother is, you know, it's, I mean, you, a lot of instability comes along with it, you know, for your young child, because you, you're not settled into a home, you're moving from location mm -hmm. to location because of employment or at school or what have you. And your child, you know, children don't get the stability that they need. Right. And I think that that's something that's really important to me now. I've, I've seen, you know, um, and had to make choices to make sure my daughter was stable. So if that meant she had to stay with her dad because I, you know, it was the best thing for her at the time, then that's what had to happen. So that's the way we managed to actually give her stability, um, even in the midst of multiple moves that I had to make. She, she, I was able to make sure that she was stable because her father was in her life, but it was tough. 
Mm-hmm. Well, it seems like that uh, may have been the uh, motivation for the type of law you do. Am I close? You know what I think happened is it's really just kind of my destiny. You know, I think that um, it's something that I remember um, really wanting a particular job or what have you. One of my friends said, no, you you belong in family court. You don't belong in district court. You belong in family court. And that was long before I, I b- believe I became a, um, a magister, uh, a referee. So it's something that I believe having the broad knowledge, my experience, and I tell you, if you knew the whole story, I've, I've had so many different life's challenges and um, life experiences. And if you put that with the legal experience that I have, it just all blends to me. The perfect company to really be um, an effective and and good judge, you know. So it all kind of comes together. Those personal experience with the struggles that we had, not having car insurance, not being able to, you know. I mean, just survival, being in survival mode. I know what it's like to be in survival mode, and you know, I haven't shared my story with a whole a lot of people. Just don't know, and some mm-hmm. people are you know, shocked to find out you were, you know, one, one young man, you know, I think they think because of the position that I'm in that I've had it easy all Mm -hmm. of my life. You're a lawyer, you know, you're a referee, you know, you have never been part of our world. You know, you've never experienced what we've experienced, but I have, I grew up in a middle-class family. I grew up with the finer things in life. I really did. And I have, I rebelled against those finer things. Because I never wanted another human being that to feel as though they lacked. I mean, I was embarrassed. I remember being embarrassed. Um, my parents had Cadillacs. And I was driving to Michigan Bell. I worked in Saginaw at the time. And I meet a group of girls in Clio. They lived in like the um, Clio area. There was that um, carpool lot. And I would meet them. And they lived in Clio and Montrose. And I'd meet them. And I was embarrassed to drive my mother's Cadillac because they didn't have that. And so I remember I just rebelled against, you know, I I didn't want other people. And so part of me has probably always had a passion for um, making sure that people have everything that they need or have a good life. I want everyone, I want every child uh, to have a good upbringing because I know what that that's like. And I know the benefits of having two parents in the home or if they're not in the home to have the parents on both on the same page. So now, now you to know, to make sure they keep their differences away from their children. So they, mm-hmm. well, now, you know, you know, I'm curious, your parents had Cadillacs. What was the first car that you bought? Oh, let's see. I remember that I purchased on my own. Yes. I, you know what happened to me? A law school friend um, got a new car. She gave me her Renault Alliance, and it was a stick shift. And I didn't know how to operate it, so I'm driving up and down the highway in the wrong gear. And I'm sure that's what happened. But that I had my first job at Legal Aid was in Saginaw. So... One day I was driving home and that car quit on me. I think I left it on the side of the road. I don't know. And then, and someone, I did, someone came and picked me up, parked it in front of my parents' house, went in and said, mom, I said, I need for you to come and co-sign for me a car because I have to get to work tomorrow and I don't have a way to get to work. And she had, they had already bought me a brand new Buick when I was in my what, 20s or whatever, um, 22 or something. They had bought me a brand new Buick Skylark with the sunroof and everything. I had a brand new car and, and you know, destroyed that car. And I said, well, you know, I need another car. I said, you know, my car broke down on me. And she said, no, you're going to have to get it yourself this time. 
And I was so angry with her. And I said, oh my God, I was stressed. It's like, I have to be at work tomorrow. I have no way to get to work. This is my first job, you know, after law school. I have no way to get to, to work. So I said, well, I'm gonna have to find a car. You know, I'm gonna just have to find a car. So I went out to Al Bennett. I think it was, is it on, was it on Hill Road? I went out, I, I got a ride out there and they yep. gave me, um, I ended up getting a red Ford Escort. That is the first car I purchased on, on my own without any help. I got back home with that car and my mother looked at me and she said, now, aren't you happy that you did that yourself? And of course I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> how, how come I knew you said that, right? <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> right. Man, you know, it has been so wonderful meeting you. We, we did the elementary school. We talked briefly about uh, Longfellow. Uh, you told us about your car adventure. What about um, high school? How was high school for you here? High school was absolutely wonderful. I was a member of the marching band in high school. When I was younger, I ran track. I mean, I have the record mary thomas i think we should be clear my my name growing up you know my uh, mary thomas my surname is okay. thomas so i you know I, you know i was just we were just so athletic track and field was really my sport but in high school i kind of um moved away from track and field but i do have the seventh grade 60 yard dash record it's still on the books um but i um marching band was my big, my huge activity. I mean, every day, I mean, I, I was a great clarinet player. I mean, from the time I was in fifth, fifth grade, uh, I played clarinet. So I was in the marching band, always first clarinet. Uh, most of the time, either first or second chair, hardly ever um, in another position. I played the in the orchestra and our concert bands. I mean, I was the one who played the solos in high school. Okay. Um, so that was, I mean, I, I, I performed well in school. I think I graduated with, you know, maybe a 3.4 GPA or something. Could have done much better. Was not really, to be honest with you. Um, I don't think I applied myself as much as I, I could have. I didn't put everything into, you know, to my, my academics and study as much as much as I could have. But um, I did just well enough, you know, just well enough. I mean, I was competitive. I was very competitive in terms of, you know, uh, my, you know, sports and, and, and marching band. Marching band was a big deal because Flint Northern had an extraordinary marching band. And we spent countless hours, I mean, countless hours in that parking lot um, doing drills. And we had choreographers or what have you. And we went to band camp. I mean, we were very serious about marching band. It was very time consuming, but that was one of the most magnificent um, experiences playing at halftime at Atwood Stadium, um, all those halftime shows with you know my sister cheering us on because I had another sister in marching band too. She played the trumpet. Okay. So we had a really really good upbringing. All right. Well, listen. At, at some point in time, you got to a place where you had more money than you needed. What was the first? luxury item that you bought for yourself? I don't know that I've gotten to that point. I mean, I, you know, probably so. What, what, you know, the first luxury item was probably, I started traveling a lot. It wasn't one particular item. I'm not materialistic. So uh -huh. I'm just not materialistic. And my, so right. much of my life, and you have to understand that. I was a I was a mother at 18 and then I became a grandmother at 18. So yeah. it was, you know, a lot of struggle. You know, we were in we were in um I was in survival mode for all of my 30s, you know. Oh, so wow. Wow. um life wasn't easy because I had to help my daughter, you know, um support her son. So it's, you know, my life wasn't that easy. So by the time um, so I you, you, you said it was really last week, right? <laughs> you said it was last week. Yeah, right. right. 
<laughs> you know, help with college and, you know, he's a senior in college now. So I think I'm finished with all of Almost that. But Listen, I mean, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So I really want you to look at that camera and, and tell us why we should vote for you. You should vote for Mary Hood for circuit court judge because of my experience. You should vote because I am dedicated, committed to our families and to, to producing better outcomes for them. You should vote for me because we don't have an African-American judge in our family division and that's where the new judge will be assigned. You should vote for me because black lawyers in Genesee County have been told that they cannot win a seat on our circuit court because they're black to dispel that racial, um, that myth. Um, there are a lot of reasons why I think you should vote for me. I care about our community, our ca I care about our children, and I really do want what's best for them um, because of uh, my life experiences as well as my, my um, legal experience. I believe that I'm a good fit for this circuit court seat and I would not have thrown my head in the ring had that not been the case. Um, at this point in my life, I don't need money. I don't need fame. I don't need a title. I have a title. I wear a judicial robe every single day. It's just that as a judge, I can have a greater impact and there'll be more responsibility and accountability. And I want that for myself. I want that for the community. All right. Mary, thank you so much for joining us. Those of you who have the opportunity to watch uh, um more of our series, make sure you subscribe, click notifications, and support the channel. We like doing what we do, but we need you to, too. Is that, can you say that? I can say that. As always, there'll be more after this. And this is your life. Enjoy. hearing here uh, with a, a special opportunity for you uh, actually that was given to us YouTube has invited us to participate in the sponsorship program so they are have set up uh, some kind of system to allow you guys to support the channel uh, there should be a button down here somewhere join support sponsor uh, click it <laughs> see what it says uh, I, I want to assure you that all the content that we always do uh, is still going to remain for you. Don't have to be a sponsor or a supporter to enjoy what we do here at Spectacle Productions, but you can be extra appreciated if you do. All right, down here, join sponsor. <sighs> See what happens. All right. Um, we're also considering starting a new show for those that do choose to sponsor, and we're calling it the Meeting After the Meeting. And we'll allow you to be guests and hosts and help come up with the content and not maybe make you a star. I do not know. All right. But rest assured, I'm enjoying the life I'm living just until I can live the life I'll enjoy. And your support and our sponsorship will get us even closer to that. Remember, there'll be more, as always, after this. And, and after this, this is your life. Go out and live it. Peace.